back in uh, 1870, about half the population lived on farms. The American home and the American farm did not have running water. So if you wanted to take a bath, uh, you had to bring the water inside in pails and heat it up over a wood fire uh, because there were no stoves. Much of the progress that we've made uh, goes beyond the increase in GDP. The world had totally changed in every conceivable way. And then we had the Great Depression of the 30s when investment just stopped. But in investment stopped, but invention and innovation did not stop. The percentage of uh, Americans who have completed college has stalled out at around 40%, partly because college is so expensive. It's amazing that uh, the number of robots in manufacturing in the U.S. Uh, has tripled in the last 15 years, and yet productivity growth has been zero. The smartphone is mainly used uh, for personal enjoyment. It's when it's something like the indoor bathroom. We don't really count much in GDP, but it makes a big difference in people's lives. I think we're going to have two competing forces in the world that are going in different directions. We need to have more growth, and uh, let's hope Chat GPT brings us some. Robert, welcome to the show, and thank you for joining me today. I'm so excited to talk about the rise and the fall of American growth. Uh, but first, you, why don't are we start- Are you more interested in the rise or the fall? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in both, because I think this there's a compelling story to be told here, and there's there's you packed 150 years of history in America into this book. So I think there's a lot of interesting interesting points I want to discuss today. But first, maybe for listeners who haven't picked up your book yet, can you share a bit about your background and why you decided to study the different elements of growth in America over the last 150 years? Well, it really all started out in graduate school when I noticed something very odd about American growth, and that is um, between the 1920s and the 1950s, um, the American economy surged ahead wound up after World War II with a much higher standard of living than had been possible in the 1920s without apparently any uh, additional capital stock. The stock of buildings and equipment, according to our government data, had run down during the 1930s, and we were left with uh, much less capital than we had in the 1920s, but much more output. And so that was a puzzle. Um, I did some papers early on in my uh, career about that. And when I uh, got back into that topic later on, uh, I wrote a paper called uh, Does the New Economy Measure Up to the Great Inventions of the Past? Uh, that was about um, 25 years ago. And ever since, I've used this phrase, the great inventions, uh, to mark off the enormous change in the standard of living, first in the United States, later copied in Western Europe, Japan, Asia, and everywhere else, made possible by epochal inventions, of which two of the most important were the invention of electricity, electric power and the electric light bulb in the late 1870s, and the invention of the internal combustion engine that made possible the motor car, and then very shortly afterwards, the powered airplane. All along uh, the way, um, I was uh, interested in just how many other uh, inventions that were completely unrelated uh, came along at the same time, of which the most important was uh, running water and indoor bathrooms, which made an incredible difference in your everyday standard of living, as you can imagine. Um, uh, there are different ways of looking at this. Uh, I have one uh, one quote from a uh, senior citizen in, 18, in 1927, looking back on his childhood in 1867, 60 years earlier. Uh, and he talked about how there were no window screens. Uh, there were horses and horse manure out in the farm, and there was nothing in between the uh, the horses and the indoor breakfast table because window screens had not been invented yet, and it was very hot in the summer, and they had to keep the windows open. Uh, so just the uh, 
exposure to flies as an ordinary part of life was ubiquitous. People uh, back in uh, 1870, about half the population lived on farms, and to plow a field, you had to hook up a horse or a mule to pull the plow. Uh, there were no tractors. Uh, there was no agricultural machinery at all. There was no fertilizer. Uh, and you were completely at the mercy of the weather, uh, plagues of insects. Uh, and it's not surprising that it took half the population to grow the food for the other half because farm productivity was so low. So you put all these things together. Life was pretty miserable uh, back in the uh, 1870s. Um, medicine was primitive. Uh, only in the 1870s did we invent either anesthetics uh, or antiseptics uh, to uh, heal wounds. Uh, and uh, it's a grisly thought, but one that helps to make vivid the uh, state of medicine. In the Civil War, when 700,000 Americans in both the North and the South were killed, uh, many more were injured uh, and wounded. And if you uh, had to have your leg amputated in the Civil War, there was no anesthetics. Uh, so uh, that's just an, a, a particularly vivid example of how poor uh, and it's really a daily struggle, uh, the standard of living was. One more example uh, before I get back to you is in uh, in the years before the invention of running water and indoor bathrooms, they had been invented earlier, even the Romans had running water, but the American home and the American farm did not have running water. The water came out of wells and then it had to be carried inside the house in pails. Uh, so if you wanted to take a bath, uh, you had to bring the water inside in pails and heat it up over a wood fire uh, because there were no stoves, no furnaces, no hot water heaters. Um, and uh, in one quote from the book, uh, in 1888, the average North Carolina housewife walked 85 miles a year carrying 50 tons of water. Uh, so that's just uh, as an example of the kind of daily struggle it was just to exist. And the book, of course, starts out, sets the stage for this daily struggle. And then going through categories like food, clothing, communications, medicine, working conditions, uh, talks about uh, the gradual improvement. Uh, the book is divided into two parts, evenly divided. Uh, the book goes from 1870 to 1910, I mean 2010, and the first uh, 70 years are between 1870 and 1940. So the uh, first part of the book breaks off in 1940, by which uh, the world had totally changed in every conceivable way. And then from 1940 until 2010, uh, the change was not nearly so profound. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, household appliances uh, that had been invented back in the 1920s uh, finally became ubiquitous. The What looked like a modern kitchen uh, is only a creature of the 1950s and 1960s. Um, but the, the, the kitchen in the average household as of 1965 is very much the same as it is today with the exception of a single device the microwave of it. Um, uh, television uh, had been invented before World War II, and uh, television as we knew, as we know it uh, was established and uh, took over the nation's entertainment in the early 1950s. Um, and uh, and uh, even then, uh, it was different than it was now because it was originally you would watch television on a 13-inch screen in black and white um, with a little tiny screen inside a great big box because back then we didn't have transistors. We had tubes, and the tubes sometimes 
blew out and had to be replaced. So it was a fragile thing. The television repair shop was a fixture of every uh, every ta- town and village. Uh, and now we don't have television repair shops because uh, televisions last seemingly forever until you replace it with an ever larger screen with ever higher uh, definition. Well, that's a lot for me to get you started. Yeah. So take off from that. Uh, whichever direction you'd like. That's awesome. Uh, I have a lot of questions about this arc of growth over the last 150 years, but first, I think it makes sense to set the stage and first ask, what is growth? How do we define this term? Because it, depending on who you ask, it can mean different things, right? There could be a quality of life improvement that doesn't get reflected in GDP numbers. Happiness can be perceived as growth sometimes, and that doesn't necessarily come through in economic measures. I want to first understand how you think about the term growth before we get into the different rates of growth throughout the last 150 years. Well, you mentioned two things, uh, GDP or gross domestic product, which is the uh, government's measure of how much we're producing and how much we're buying uh, since every purchase creates income for someone. Total income per person is the same as uh, total expenditures per person. Uh, We measure these expenditures and then we express them in the prices of a given year to eliminate the effect of inflation. Uh, So, uh, for instance, if uh, if in uh, 1910 people bought 50 bottles of Coca Cola per person, um, and the population was 100 million, I guess that comes out at something like 5 billion uh, bottles of Coca-Cola. And that contribution to GDP would not be measured at the 5 cents it cost in the year 1900, 1910, uh, but at the 50 cents or so that would cost today to buy the same amount of Coca-Cola. So a real GDP eliminates the effect of inflation. It measures the activities that were being uh, conducted and purchased in any year in the past at the prices, more or less, of uh, today. So that's GDP per person, but that's not the entire story. Uh, you mentioned the word happiness. Um, take something like uh, running water uh, that made possible the indoor bathroom and got rid of the outhouse. Uh, that made only a small contribution to uh, GDP. Once the bathroom was built, uh, the only real expense was the cost of the running water, which in many places was free. But of course, there was an enormous increase in happiness uh, with the ability to uh, combine a hot water heater with running water and take a bath or a shower um, and have running water not only in the bathroom, but also in the kitchen. Um, So much of the progress that we've made uh, goes beyond the increase in GDP. Just in the same way, in the most recent uh, 15 years, we've had the invention of the smartphone, uh, which combines many older inventions like the telephone, the camera, um, and uh, recorded music. Uh, But uh, that has virtually no role in GDP. Uh, People are much happier, except for the depressed teenagers who look at Facebook too much. Uh, And uh, uh, GDP barely registers. Um, Most of these uh, smartphones, almost all of them, are actually made in China or other countries, and so they don't enter our uh, GDP at all, what we're producing in our 50 states. Uh, So, uh, we measure economic growth as the percent change in real GDP per person from one period to another. Uh, if we want to know what economic growth was between 1870 and 1940, we take 1940 real GDP divided by 1870 real GDP, um, take the log, maybe a word I shouldn't use, and then divide by the 70 years between those two years and get a, a growth rate which turns out to be about 2% per year. If something's growing at 2% a year, it doubles every 35 years. And so since 1870, our uh, 
standard of living doubled from 1870 to 1905, doubled again from 1905 to 1940, doubled again from 1940 uh, to 1975. Um, and then it started slowing down. Uh, so our uh, GDP per person has, has uh, throughout history grown at about 2%, but in recent years, the recent two decades, more like 1%. And if it grows at 1%, then it takes twice as long to double. Uh, this is something that should be of great interest to your younger um, viewers or listeners, uh, because uh, today's generation uh, is going to take both their children and their grandchildren to become twice as well off as they are, whereas every previous generation, it only took one generation uh, to become twice as well off as your parents. Uh, so uh, it's a real uh, component of everyday life, uh, the struggles that many young people are having, uh, finding enough money to buy a home, uh, finding enough money to go through college uh, without massive student debt. Uh, a lot of the issues that uh, are everyday concerns now uh, were not as vivid and real in people's lives uh, in earlier generations. Uh, so mm -hmm. back to you. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, I also want to bring attention to something you mentioned in the book, the, the role of people and the role of capital in creating growth. And so there's like, I think there's two ways that someone might think about growth. One is you just have more people and they're producing more things. Another might be capital and automation and some other tools to get leverage on someone's ability to create more things. What is well, the role of those two over the last 150 years? And how have that, how has that changed? The way we measure the improvement in our well-being is either GDP per person or GDP per hour. Um, if we uh, talk about GDP per hour, that has another name called productivity. Uh, the amount each hour of work is uh, producing. And productivity growth is the, the source of our overall improvement in well-being. We can use that increase in productivity in our output per hour, either to work fewer hours and have longer vacations, that would be one use of our productivity, or we could use it to work the same number of hours and have that increase in output per hour translate directly into output per person um, with the each person working the same number of hours. So productivity is the source of our growth. And productivity in turn uh, depends on how many machines each worker has, each worker hour, um, and economic growth is enormously aided by an increase in the total value of the machines, again, correcting for inflation, uh, that each worker has to work with. Um, but growth goes beyond that. Uh, it was shown long ago um, that we can't account for the full increase in our standard of living by just counting up um, machines of a given type. What's happening is that ever better machines are being built. Uh, we're uh, moving from horses, which were a type of capital, to tractors with internal combustion engines, to ever more powerful and larger tractors. And as a result, um, now we have, of course, uh, tractors that can guide themselves and have built-in uh, GPS uh, location uh, capabilities that can plow a field or plant seeds without human intervention. So it's the improvement in the quality of the machines uh, that is the uh, is the real source of our growth, um, and uh, an economist put it this way: If there were no improvement in the machines, then economic growth would consist of piling more wooden plows on top of the existing wooden plows. Um, but the fact we are not relying on wooden plows anymore; we're not even re relying on metal plows, we're relying on very advanced computerized uh, tractors, combines, and other agricultural machines. So the, the, 
the word for this improvement in the quality of machines, um, uh, typically the measure of the machines doesn't fully reflect their quality, uh, comes out in uh, something called technical change. So the sources of uh, economic growth are primarily growth in the number of machines per hour or the size of them, um, the quality of them, and then a, th a third component of economic growth is education. Back at the turn of the last century in 1900, only 10% of Americans completed high school. By 1980, that uh, had grown to about 85% from 10%. And you can bet that the fact that far more of our population were educated in high school, had been through basic arithmetic and algebra, um, maybe knew a foreign language, um, contributed to the fact that we were much more productive at the end of the 20th century than we were at the beginning. Now, later on, we'll talk about some of the headwinds that have slowed down the, the rate of growth, as I mentioned before. And one of them is that the transition to a population that has fully completed high school has already taken place. Very few people now don't graduate from high school. If they don't graduate from actual high school, they go back and get a GED degree uh, that substitutes for high school. Mm -hmm. um, then there's college. Uh, the percentage of uh, Americans who have completed college has stalled out at around 40%, partly because college is so expensive. Uh, so that, that source of growth of more and more of the population being college educated uh, was a real driver of economic growth between 1950 and uh, 2000, uh, but is less so uh, now. So just to uh, wrap up that, that idea, uh, output per hour productivity can grow because each hour of work by a human being is working with a larger number of machines, bigger machines, that's called capital per hour. Second reason is technology. The usefulness of the machines uh, to produce output is growing. And then the third that I said was education. Amazing. Okay, so now we have an understanding of growth and productivity. I want to then go look at these different phases that you mentioned in the book. And I want to, I want to talk about the, the innovation that leads to growth. And you, you highlight a few of these in your book. You first mentioned in this first industrial revolution phase, I believe you said it was the steam engine that kind of then led to trains, steamships, iron steel. The second industrial revolution then was electric power, light bulbs, that, and the internal combustion engine leading to AC, lighting, cars, and all these other things. And then your, your third industrial revolution, computers, leading to all the advances that we've seen in technology and communications. Right. And let's, I, just, let's just, for the audience, be clear on when these three industrial revolutions took place. Sure. Uh, the first industrial revolution with the steam engine and cotton spinning and cotton weaving being automated uh, took place between 1750 and 1830. Um, then there was a lull with not that that much being invented, but the transition uh, made possible by the railroad and the steamship uh, was the dominant um, source of progress between, say, 1830 and uh, 1900. Then the second Industrial Revolution came, came in starting in 1870. Uh, we had the uh, electric light bulb in 1879, the internal combustion engine in 1879, the first electric power plant to uh, bring electricity to nearby homes and businesses in New York in 1882. So this period of 1870 to 1880s was full of, of inventions, the telephone in 1875, uh, another one, photography, which uh, barely had gotten started in the Civil War. Um, and then uh, it took a long time for these um, second industrial revolution inventions to percolate through the economy. Uh, the real impact of electric motors in manufacturing was something that uh, waited until the 1920s. Uh, even though wireless transmission had been uh, invented in 1895, it wasn't until 1920 that we got the first 
a commercial radio station. Uh, and then television was invented in the 20s and 30s, but the first TV stations were delayed by World War II and came on the air in 1946 and 47. Then the um, computer revolution was pretty, pretty drawn out. Um, we had the first electronic computers right after World War II, um, more and more powerful mainframe computers uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then the invention of the personal computer uh, with the uh, path-breaking IBM personal computer in 1982, uh, complemented by Microsoft uh, software in uh, uh, the 1980s. Um, as just one anecdote, um, IBM uh, subcontracted the software of the IBM personal computer to a young fledgling firm called Microsoft. Uh, and if we look at the world today, it's Microsoft that's a gigantic uh, machine val valued at uh, several trillion dollars, and IBM is just a shadow of its former self. So they made a very bad decision in 1982 to farm out the software because that's where the money, the real money was made. It turned out that making the computer hardware was just a commodity. Uh, anyway, uh, the personal computer revolution started in 1982 um, and was joined by the web browser in 1995. And very shortly after that, we have the search engines of Google starting in 1998, the transition to broadband away from hooking up to your telephone. Uh, I remember when I would go on a trip uh, around 1995 and I wanted to uh, get my email and I was on a trip, I would take my laptop into the hotel room and unplug the phone and get the phone and plug it into a phone plug in the corner of my laptop and hook up uh, through the phone line using a code that was recorded in my laptop uh, that would go beep, 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 beep and connect my laptop with the uh, computer back at my home university. Uh, so uh, we've gone way beyond that with broadband and you're always connected and uh, soon uh, after the search engine came the flat screen that we're all now used to, both on our television sets and our computers. Um, uh, now, is there a fourth industrial revolution? Everybody's excited about artificial intelligence uh, and uh, robots. Uh, so far, uh, these two components of the fourth revolution, AI and robots, have not shown up in our productivity statistics. Um, it's amazing that uh, the number of robots in manufacturing in the US uh, has tripled in the last 15 years, and yet productivity growth has been zero uh, in manufacturing. So we've got some real puzzles out, that, out there. As, uh, the, I, I do have the answer to the robot puzzle, and there just aren't enough of them. Uh, robots are very, few in number compared to the overall size of the uh, number of machines. We, we call the total number of machines valued in dollars, we call that the capital stock. And the amount of investment that brings new capital in is about a trillion dollars a year for new machines. And robots make up only about 1% of that. Uh, so uh, everywhere you look, there, there are machines that are not robots that are being purchased, including those new um, flat screen replacements for cash registers that you see in every uh, large and small store. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the four industrial revolutions. We're still waiting uh, to see the real impact of the fourth. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So there's this, it seems like in all of these cases, there is an innovation that acts as like a catalyst. And then it leads to a few follow on inventions. And then over the next few decades, it seems like uh, growth in the economy reacts to those innovations, that those innovations percolate throughout the economy. Is it, is it fair to say that we have had enough time in this third industrial revolution now to see all these changes from the computer percolate through the economy? Or are things like AI and robotics just extensions of that third 
invention there with the computer. And it may just I mean, take I think 10 or 20 that's years. That's a very good point. Whether, um, whether AI and <clears throat> robots uh, should be considered just an extension of the third industrial revolution, the digital age, um, and a further fruition, uh, just as the smartphone was. Uh, that's drawing a line that really is not very important. Um, back in 87, uh, when the economy seemed to have slowed down its productivity growth uh, from the golden age before 1970, um, around 1987, the famous Nobel Prize winner Robert Solo said, we can see the computer age everywhere but in the productivity statistics. Um, and that was uh, 1987, if we think of it, was the time when um, every professor by then would have become used to his first, his or her first uh, personal computer, uh, as pathetic and small as the memory and speed of those early computers were. Uh, the computers were all around us in our offices, but we couldn't see the productivity payoff. Um, right after that, um, an economic historian at Stanford named Paul David wrote a famous article in which he said, just wait, uh, it's coming. The productivity effect of the computer is coming because look at the electric motor. Uh, as I said, the first electric power um, uh, first was produced in 1882, and it wasn't until 1920, about 40 years later, that the real impact in manufacturing productivity of electric machines uh, became evident. So Paul David said, just wait. Uh, the Electronic computers had been around for uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, the mainframes had been around. Um, and suddenly, in 1995, a productivity revolution occurred in the United States. Oddly enough, not in Western Europe, but in the United States, our productivity growth doubled. Um, it was 1.5% per year uh, between the early 70s and mid-90s. And then for a decade, we enjoyed productivity growth of around 3% a year um, as all these things I mentioned uh, became in common use. Uh, the personal computer, ever faster, ever greater memory uh, with web browsers, search engines, e-commerce, flat screens, and broadband, all those things came into play almost all at once between 1995 and 2000. Uh, you may remember the phrase dot .com. Uh, dot .com, of course, is the suffix for web addresses. And the revolution of the late 1990s, with all these things happening at once, was called the dot .com revolution. The stock market went crazy. Um, and the value of the S&P 500 stock market index tripled between 1995 and 2000. Uh, it didn't stay up uh, forever. Uh, but uh, that was the euphoric dot-com age when it seemed as if everything was uh, a new world. Um, and uh, in my reckoning, by 10 years later, by 2005, the impact of the digital revolution on business firms uh, was pretty much over. The use of desktop and laptop computers in business, and the speed and power of them um, is not that much different today than it was in 2005, almost 20 years ago. And that's one reason why our productivity growth has slowed down. The smartphone is the big invention of the last 20 years, um, but the smartphone is mainly used uh, for personal enjoyment. It's, when, it's something like the indoor bathroom. We don't really count much in GDP, but it makes a big difference in people's lives. Um, and it remains to be seen whether AI is something like uh, the smartphone or whether we have uh, another big upsurge in productivity. I'm skeptical about AI, but we can talk about that later on when we get to the more modern yeah. uh, issues. So one thing I'm trying to understand is like when you think about the big innovations that, that preceded some of the growth in these different phases, how much of the growth is dependent on that one innovation and how much of the growth is dependent on 
other cultural factors, dynamism. There's, there's a lot of other factors at play that could contribute to these growth statistics. And I'm, I'm curious to know, is it, is it just like, if we happen to get lucky with one really big breakthrough innovation, the next 30, 40 years are smooth sailing from a growth standpoint, or is it, are, is it multifaceted? Are there different pieces that are required to, to get sustainable long-term growth? Uh, I think pretty much the, uh, the, the way to think about this is um, each of these inventions um, has a different story on how it happened. Uh, Thomas Edison experimented with hundreds of different types of filament to get something that would create an electric light bulb that would last for more than a few seconds. Um, and as a result of tireless experimentation, all of a sudden he developed something that was almost ubiquitous within 10 years, talking of electric light. Uh, and electric power, as I said, took longer. Um, electric power made possible of course, the subsequent digital age wouldn't have been possible without electric power. So you could argue that electric power was the big invention of the last 200 years, even more important than steam power, um, because most of the uh, steam engines have been replaced now with smaller and more efficient uh, electric motors. Uh, the internal combustion engine we now see is being replaced by electric vehicles, um, but not everywhere. Uh, we don't have electric-powered airplanes. We don't have electric-powered ships. Uh, and so uh, the internal combustion engine, which propelled transport for the entire period from its invention in 1879 up until now, um, is another very profound uh, invention because it uh, eventually um, uh, steam engines were replaced by diesel um, powered trains that were much more efficient. Uh, coal powered naval ships were replaced starting with the British in World War I by oil powered uh, ships. Uh, so um, you could argue that number two next to electricity, the internal combustion engine and its effect on the world as we know it, uh, is the second most important invention. And that also was the result of much tinkering and experimentation by a number of inventors. Uh, it's generally credited to Carl Benz, the, the Benz that forms the name of the Mercedes-Benz Corporation. Um, and then the other uh, great inventions, communications, uh, the telephone, uh, the telegraph. Um, I could tell uh, stories about uh, what the world was like before the telegraph. Uh, back then, before 1845, the communication of news could go no faster than the horse's hoof or the uh, sailboats sail. Railroads, of course, were just coming in. And um, while there were very few railroads in 1840, by 1860, that was another uh, way you could uh, communicate. Uh, but in, in one famous example, the War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain um, was settled by a peace treaty signed in Belgium in early December 1814. And yet Andrew Jackson fought the final war, the battle of the war, the battle of New Orleans against the British in the middle of January 1815, about five weeks later, because nobody knew the war was over because it took so long to get the news from Belgium to New Orleans. Wow. Um, and as you can imagine, in those days, it took a sailing ship plus a horse bound a horse uh, Pony Express type news coverage. So uh, that just gives you a, an idea again of just how incredibly primitive uh, the standard of living was uh, if we go back then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's wild to think about. And I, I think reading your book, even for someone who's not, if someone is listening to this and they think to themselves, 
I'm really not interested in economics. I don't really care much about inflation. Just the historical information about what life was like in the last 150 years, to me, was mind blowing. And, and that, that already and was a just, totally new perspective. You won't learn a thing about inflation from my book. Don't worry <laughs> about that. <laughs> you, won't, you won't understand why it happened, when it happened, or if it'll happen again. Uh, because that's not what the book is about. The book is about the standard of living, what everyday life was like for people, mainly for average people, people in the bottom half of the income distribution. Um, we've got plenty of um, uh, Gilded Age type TV series to show us uh, what life was like for the elite um, rich people at the top. But this book is about the majority of the people who. Uh, were living from day to day, but the um, types of jobs they had uh, just completely changed. Uh, and we've only touched on that with the fact that half of half of the workers in the country as late as 1900 were on farms struggling to make, to grow crops without anything but the help of a horse or a mule. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move to the the second kind of phase in your book. So the first phase, you're chronicling from 1870 up till about 1920. Then you have 1920, 1970, and 1970 onwards. That 1920, 1970 phase, it was the fastest time of growth in America. And you mentioned a couple of the innovations that the electric power and the internal combustion engine leading to that. But you also mentioned in the book the the role that the Great Depression and World War II might have played. Can you talk to me about how those affected growth and, and why during a time when we had two horrible events, we also saw tremendous growth? Well, let's, let's step back to the 1920s. The 1920s were known as the Roaring Twenties. Uh, there was a lot of um, implementation of those great inventions. Um, uh, Electric motors became common in manufacturing, replacing uh, inefficient steam engines. It used to be a factory would have a big steam engine in the middle, and then a whole set of rubber give power, bring power from the central steam engine to the individual worker. And that was very inefficient because it would be very hard to regulate the speed of these leather and rubber belts, and they were always breaking. That was replaced by having individual small electric motors right at the workstation of each worker. Uh, and electric tools became common, as well as electric uh, machines. Uh, so that uh, revolution was well underway in the 1920s. And then we had the Great Depression of the 30s when investment just stopped. But in investment stopped, but invention and innovation did not stop. There was a lot of stuff invented in the 1930s that just did not have a chance to influence the economy uh, because uh, demand was so slack and business firms were hanging on trying to avoid bankruptcy and didn't have any money to uh, to buy these newly developed uh, innovations. One of the one of the uh, landmarks of the 1930s is that's when most of the everyday plastics that we use in our economy today were uh, were developed. And also the first antibiotics uh, were developed. Sulfa was the first antibiotic, followed by penicillin, which was invented during World War II. Then came the war. And uh, in in my view, the the great puzzle that I first identified back in, in graduate school of this enormous increase in the economy's ability to um, produce goods and services uh, had several different components. First of all, the things that were invented in the 1930s already were becoming evident in a huge increase in productivity in 1940 and 41 before the war actually broke out. Another thing that happened is that partly because of the New Deal under Roosevelt and the uh, early impact of labor unions, we made a transition from the 60-hour week to a 40-hour week. Um, and it turned out that people could do, because 60-hour weeks were so tiring, people could do almost as much work 
in a 40 hour week as in a 60 hour week. So that, of course, if you're doing the same production in that many fewer hours, that raises productivity, which is the ratio of output per hour. So the hours were shrinking as the output was staying the same or uh, going up. And then I think there was an intensity to production in World War II. People just learned how to be more efficient and cut corners because of the all-out war effort. Everybody was pulling together. Uh, the the nature of cooperation between uh, business firms and workers uh, took on a new phase. There's still a lot of controversy about <clears throat> how we wound up in 1948 uh, producing so much more than we did in 1929. How much of it happened before the war broke out? How much was due to what uh, people learned during the war? But we wound up in 1948 with just a, a much higher level of productivity and output per person. Um, economists, as the war was ending, were terribly afraid that we'd go back into the Great Depression because nobody really understood the Depression and assumed that once the government's enormous spending on wartime uh, uh, weapons um, tailed off, that the economy would sink back without the government demand. But it didn't happen. Um, the reason it didn't happen was understood almost immediately, and that was uh, because of rationing, because people couldn't buy anything during the war. Food was rationed. Clothing was rationed. Uh, you couldn't buy an automobile. Automobiles just weren't produced. You couldn't buy appliances. All these new appliances had been invented, that you couldn't buy them. So people got paid for working in the war plants, but they couldn't buy anything, so they saved all their money. Uh, a huge amount of saving took place in 1943, 44, 45. And the minute the uh, war was over, people went running out trying to buy things. And so the much heralded return of the Great Depression did not occur. And the economy went on to the prosperity of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, we didn't really uh, come off of that uh, sort of steady 25 years of prosperity until the early 1970s. Uh, so that's that's sort of a general picture of this uh, remarkable increase. Now, the, the increase in our productivity that happened mysteriously between 1929 and 48 comes out in my book as just a, a golden age of uh, 50 years. Between 1920 and 1970, uh, productivity growth in the U.S. was 3% a year for almost 50 straight years. Faster than it was before 1920, faster than it was after uh, 1970. Um, and I have not seen any uh, kind of general set of ideas besides this notion of the great inventions uh, that uh, can explain uh, that uh, that particular timing. Now, in Europe and Japan, productivity growth wasn't fast in the 20s and 30s. It picked up after World War II because there had been so much destruction, so much chaos, uh, so much damaging of, of capital buildings and equipment. So in, uh, in France, the period between uh, 1945 and 1975 is known in French as Les Trente Glorieuses, the glorious 30 years. Um, and uh, that's because the things that we were developing and inventing in the United States in the 20s and 30s weren't really feasible in Europe or J Japan until uh, 1945. If you look at productivity growth in Western Europe, it was not just 2% or 3%, it was 5% between 1950 and 1975, uh, and that was uh, the result of this big backlog of inventions that had already started percolating in the U.S. economy and just hadn't made it across the Atlantic. Mm. One thing you mentioned was the hours spent working in the 30s and 40s, it dropped around the, the New Deal. It went from 60 hours to 40 hours. And I believe before that, before 60 hours, it would have just been working on your farm all day until until you're done basically well, of course, so 
of, you know, of course, the the fifty percent uh, of the workforce in agriculture uh, were working from dawn until dusk during the harvest season and the planting season, and, they, and during the winter in North Dakota, they weren't even going outside. So, of course, it was a very uneven uh, uh, number of hours of work. But if we talk right. about the non-farm uh, part of the economy, the workers in manufacturing, services, retail, um, the average work week was 60 hours a week during the time from 1870 to uh, the late 1920s. And then uh, we came out of World War II, and it was more like 40 hours a week. And the exact time when that change took place is distorted by the uh, Great Depression. Got it. Okay, so 19, uh, late 1800s to early 1900s, we're at 60 hours a week. After World War II, we're at 40 hours a week. Today, People are asked. People are staying at home, collecting stimulus checks, asking for <laughs> four-day work weeks. What is your view on how that evolves over time? Is forty hours like what makes forty hours an optimal number? Is it just was it just kind of picked out of a hat? Do we go yeah, it's, up from here? It's, Do it's, we go down yeah, from here? It's eight times five, and right. Many, um, many, many clerical workers, office workers. Uh, work 37 and a half hours a week, which is seven and a half times five. Uh, of course, we now have the work at home movement, uh, and who knows how much uh, the people are actually working at home uh, unless they're hooked up by Zoom all day. Uh, it's very hard to monitor it. And there's a uh, this goes beyond the book because working at home is a, a phenomenon of the last two or three years. Um, but uh, there's a lot of controversy now about whether. Uh, that's good or bad for productivity, and whether people today are working or doing something else during the hours they would otherwise be commuting into work. Those commuting hours are now available either for work or for home activities that are not work. Um, and I don't think we have the uh, the government surveys are not yet up to the task of answering that question. Um, uh -huh. Would you like to see, like, it, just a, from a personal perspective, having studied growth and productivity, do you think if you were in charge of setting work hours for America today, would you be advocating for a more than 40 hours a week or less than 40 hours a week or just keeping things the same? You're going to make me sound like a slave driver. No <laughs> way. <laughs> no, I think um, in. Most European countries, they've chosen to reduce work hours not by going to a 30-hour uh, week, but rather to take longer vacations. They want their vacation time bunched together, so they have four or five-week vacations in France and Germany, and that's universal. It's part of uh, labor law uh, that they have to have those vacations. In the United States, there are many things that are different about the United States that are, in comparison to Europe, anti-worker. We not only have shorter vacations, we don't have parental leave uh, for new parents. Um, we don't have uh, as generous uh, sick leave. Um, and uh, we also retire later. Uh, you know, the French are going through conniptions fighting the government, which is trying to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64, uh, whereas our to get your full Social Security um, uh, amount, you have to work until 70. Uh, to get a medium amount, you have to work till 67. Uh, and if you quit at 62 and retire, uh, your annual Social Security payments are substantially reduced. Um, but basically, the retirement age in the U.S. is later than it is in, in many countries. So we do work harder, um, particularly in, in having shorter vacations uh, than other countries. And there's no particular movement in this country to change that because labor unions are so weak, um, despite the victory of the UAW in the recent auto contracts. Uh, uh, we have um, 
much less influence of labor unions than in, in a country like Germany or Scandinavia. But now again, mm. we're getting past the time horizon of the book, which ends in 1910. Right. Okay. Um, let's let's go into the the kind of headwind phase here, and this would be 1970 to present. Let's say, um, what was it about this period that caused growth to slow down? Because this is the the rise was kind of the first phase and the second phase, and then now this is the fall of American growth. Why is it slowing down now? Okay. Well, let's. Uh, we had almost three percent annual growth in productivity. Over those 50 years, the golden 50 years between 1920 and 1970, um, from 1970 until now, uh, the numbers more like one and a half percent. Less than that over the last 15 years. More than that in the decade that I call the dot com decade between 1995 and 2005. So it's not been even. It's not been a uniform slowdown. But uh, everybody wondered about the source of the slowdown, which was quite evident starting in the early 1970s. Productivity growth noticeably slowed down after the um, after the uh, 19. My answer is the obverse of the explanation of the great 50 years, and that is we ran out of the uh, impact of the inventions. There's only so much they could do. The households had their appliances. The factories had their electric machines. Um, 1970, by 1970, we'd already made the transition from the piston commercial aircraft to the jet commercial aircraft. The Boeing 707 was introduced in 1958, and we're not going any faster now than we were in 1958 on the Boeing 707. Uh, so, uh, commercial aircraft speeds, uh, reached a peak. So it wasn't that we went slower. It's just that we stopped growing ever faster. Uh, so if you think of the enormous change between the sailboat and the horse uh, before 1840 and the subsonic jet plane going at 550 miles an hour, uh, that was uh, that transition had been made. And uh, in another uh, interesting comparison there's a there's a letter i think uh in a recent issue of financial times the british uh equivalent of the wall street journal a uh letter writer wrote to the financial times um and mentioned my book and referred to her grandfather who had lived a primitive life in a cabin on the plane maybe one horse and her grandfather, who had grown up in that primitive uh, environment, lived to see a man on the moon in 1969. And the letter writer said, we have not made the same speed or degree of progress from 1912 to 1969 that my grandfather lived through. Uh, that has happened. What's happened since 1969 to 2023 that's comparable? Well, the personal computer and the smartphone. Uh, and the microwave oven, uh, that's about it. Uh, but it's not as profound uh, as uh, what uh, what happened before. Uh, so uh, that's the basic explanation. Now, you talked about the headwinds. Um, in no particular order, uh, the first headwind is education. I mentioned that we went from 10% completing high school in 1900 up to about 85% by 1970, very slow increase since then. So much of the improvement in education had already occurred by 1970. Um, the, in, the number of completing college has crept up incrementally, is now around 40%, uh, but doesn't seem to be going any higher, uh, partly due to the enormous cost of college and the burden of student debt and the fact that college tuition has gone up so much faster than uh, other prices. Uh, next headwind is inequality, uh, that uh, much of the benefit worker, the median household, um, and uh, the share of total GDP going to wages uh, has gone down 
uh, substantially over the last um, uh, 40 years. And the share going to profits has gone up. Uh, just uh, as one example of that, prices since, I'm going to take a year like 1960. Since 1960, prices have gone up by a factor of almost 10. But since 1960, the value of the U.S. stock market has gone up by a factor of about 50. And the ratio of the value of the stock market to GDP has doubled uh, since any time in the past you want to you want to pick out. Uh, so uh, the opportunity for increased income and wealth of those who have uh, the resources to buy stocks over consistently over the last uh, 30 or 40 years uh, has created an enormous gap of inequality. We know that there's a huge gap of inequality between uh, whites and blacks in the United States, and there's certainly a huge gap between the top 1% or 2% and everyone else uh, due to the enormous value of, uh, of the stock market. Um, and this is a particularly American phenomenon. The, the value of the big seven companies uh, that are propelling the stock market, uh, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, uh, Facebook, et cetera, um, Microsoft, uh, the value of those seven companies is equal to the value of all the stock markets in Europe. All the companies in Europe are worth the same as the seven biggest companies in the United States. So this stock market uh, inequality is a particularly American uh, phenomenon. We also have not only higher wealth at the top, we also have lower income and wealth at the bottom. We have a larger percentage of our population in poverty. Um, I mentioned before that we have uh, less uh, shorter vacations, less maternal leave. Uh, we also have much less generous child allowances and other forms of mitigation of uh, of poverty. So inequality and the shift away from wages that has kept uh, the bottom half of the income distribution from enjoying the full fruits of our GDP, which itself is growing slower, uh, is the second headwind. Um, mm. uh, the, the third headwind, which is uh, a little bit the fiscal debt, the the enormous government debt that has been generated uh, by the struggle uh, to fight the great financial crisis recession of 2009, by the enormous amount of money that was pumped into the economy during the pandemic. Remember all those $1,200 checks uh, that were uh, that were sent out. Uh, so uh, uh, that's going to uh, limit the ability of the government to do things in the future because it's going to have to pay much higher interest on the debt, and that's the nature of the uh, of of that headwind. Uh, right. There okay. Are, you know, we um, we need to uh, bring this to a close soon, and I just wanted to make sure that I was able to um, uh, advocate my favorite policy. Uh, prescriptions uh, before you even ask what they are, uh, and and that is um, we need a drastic reform of our immigration system so that we have a, uh, a set of legal immigration quotas that are much higher, but they're based on skills, education, language ability, and ability to take skilled jobs, and also the ability to fill labor shortages and things like. Uh, agricultural harvesting. Um, and along with that, uh, we need to do something about the enormous inequality of uh, students' capabilities as they come out of college. Too too many of our uh, high school students cannot pass basic tests of reading and math in the eighth grade or the 11th grade. Um, and to deal with that, I think we need to go all the way back into preschool education and have 
universal preschool, but in particular, preschool that's heavily oriented toward uh, minority and disadvantaged groups uh, to try to uh, reduce that tremendous vocabulary gap that emerges as early as kindergarten. Mm. Okay, this is all this is all very helpful in understanding these headwinds that were we faced in the last fifty years. There's one other theory that I've seen all over the internet. It wasn't specifically called out in your book, but I wanted to bring it up and get your view on it uh, as well. And this theory, it, it basically there's a website. It's called What Happened in 1971, and it's all about. It shows a ton of charts of things that have gotten worse basically since 1971 very close to the 1970 kind of time frame you you highlight in the book and the reason what exactly they, is it again i got to look this up it's well the, the website's called wtf happened in 1971 and uh it it basically shows all these charts of things that have gotten worse in the last 50 years and they oh, I got to see this i got to see this yeah it's a great website i highly recommend you check it out but the the thing that they imply in this website is the thing that did happen in 1971 was that the U.S. went off the gold standard. They suspended the <laughs> redeemability of dollars and gold. So the, they kind of tie in that with all the other things, the ills of, that have gone wrong in the last 50 years. And they claim that that is a playing a, a major role in the rising inequality, the rising debt levels, being able to print more money. Not having to re redeem, not having to you know give someone gold in return for their dollars. Um, these that they believe that these things kind of contribute to the headwinds that we're seeing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what role money has to play in this, in, in whether or not the U.S. going off the gold standard about 50 years ago has played a role in exacerbating all these issues. It's funny you bring this up because uh, one of my best friends is a a elderly economist who uh, dates all the ills of the American economy back to going off gold in 1971. So I'm very familiar with this. Uh, the You might ask, what does gold and the gold standard have to do with inequality or uh, the well-being of average Americans who've never heard of the gold standard? And the, the channel by which it matters is that the the monetary system since um, 1971 has been one of flexible exchange rates. Uh, that is, the value of the dollar goes up and down. Now, when the dollar is very valuable, which has ha happened uh, again and again, and is true right now, uh, it's very expensive for foreigners to buy American exports, and it's very cheap for Americans to buy foreign imports. Um, and uh, this exp expensive dollar, uh, which makes foreign currencies cheap, uh, first uh, uh, first uh, became a real problem in the mid-1990s. Uh, it was sort of covered over by the dot-com revolution. But starting in the 1970s, uh, sorry, in the 1990s, uh, we got this great flood of imports from China. And China kept their exchange rate very cheap. And so it was very cheap to buy goods from China, and many American factories went out of business, and their workers, often in small Midwestern towns uh, like Fort Wayne, Indiana, or um, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, uh, suddenly found that uh, not only were all the factories in the town closed down with no good-paying union jobs, but they couldn't move because their houses weren't worth anything because there was no demand for housing in that uh, stricken community. Uh, so the link between the exchange rate of the dollar being too high and the demise of American manufacturing jobs is the one clear connection uh, between international monetary policy and these working conditions of, of everyday American workers. Um, I think the uh, emphasis on the gold standard is is exaggerated um, because if you go deeper into this, which has nothing to do with my book at all, um, China could have chosen to have a very low exchange rate and to keep its goods cheap, even under the old gold standard system. 
Uh, after all, Britain devalued its pound in 1967 um, and made its exports cheaper. And any any country could have made its exports cheaper, even under the old system. So I think the um, – I hope there's more to the 1971 website than just the gold standard because uh, a lot – uh, a lot of things are worse off. The, the thing that really stands out about the 1970s is that this was the first decade when productivity growth really slowed down. And if we measure the median wage of the average worker, there's been very little improvement since the late 1970s. Uh, we've had almost um, four decades, say 1980 to 2020, of um, real wage growth less than uh, half a percent a year. Remember I said 2% a year you'll double in 35 years, 1% a year you'll double in 70 years. Well, if the right things have been going, uh, it's going to take a lot longer than a century for the average living standard of the uh, median family to uh, to double. Uh, so that's certainly the timing is right, that uh, things started to go wrong after 1971. And um, many of the inventions uh, take the smartphone. The smartphone does not put dinner on the table. Uh, mm -hmm. may, you may be able to look up recipes on the smartphone, but you can't actually buy the food you need uh, to put in the oven uh, from a smartphone. Um, and uh, you know far better than I, because I'm sure you use your smartphone much more than I do, uh, that many of the uses of smartphones for taking videos, for doing uh, social networking, uh, for listening to music, um, are entertainment. And so we've got just vastly more sources of entertainment uh, than we used to, but life is not all about entertainment. That's right. Yeah. Just to highlight one other point that the the, the 1971 crowd believes in it, like going off of the gold standard, I think is um, it, by, by making money less valuable and now at, at the, at the whim of a government to print, I think the, the case that this crowd would make is that now your savings are no longer protected. You have to start looking further and further out on the risk curve in order to get, in order to get ahead, meaning buying up real estate, buying up stocks, exacerbating that, that inequality that you kind of mentioned um and that you know you may not be incentivized to save and and think long term anymore and you're now all of a sudden looking for maybe it's entertainment maybe you're looking for short term dopamine bursts rather than uh you know building something for the long run because your your wealth is corroding if you can't <clears throat> store it in something that is finite and scarce that's the, yeah, that's the there there your chronology is all wrong uh, mm. We had a lot of inflation in the 70s um, connected with the first and second oil shock when oil prices went up so much. Um, but since 1990, from 1990 to 2020, we had 30 straight years of average 2% inflation. Very stable. None of the things you just mentioned were occurring. Um, the inflation we've had in the last two and a half years uh, broke a record of 30 years of of steady 2% inflation. And we know now that it was a pandemic inflation that took took the form of people who could not buy services, could not, uh, would not go to retail stores, restaurants, concerts, sporting events, uh, took their money and they bought goods, um, particularly home computers, home exercise machines. Um, and we developed a tremendous shortage of these goods. Uh, car prices went way up because of a shortage of computer chips. And um, the uh, Ukraine war uh, led to a temporary upward shooting of uh, gasoline prices. Uh, so we had a shortage inflation. The success of the Federal Reserve in bringing inflation down uh, tells us really nothing about the power of the Fed. It tells us that the shortages unwound. Uh, and that people no longer were afraid to go to the gym, so they'd stop buying exercise equipment. And they no longer had a shortage of computer chips, so they, uh, the price of used cars and rental cars uh, came down. Uh, so the 
inflation we've had of 2022 and 2023 was very unique, uh, was very tied in with the pandemic, and had nothing to do with going off the gold standard. Um, and the 20 year, the 30 years before 2020, uh, we had a mysteriously benign uh, regime that people don't quite understand how inflation was so stable for so long. Uh, mm -hmm. So that aspect of the 1971 story, I don't think uh, works out. Yeah, that's fair. I, I hear you on the, the different phases there. I guess to finally follow up on on this and kind of wrap this up, uh, is the is the power to print money without having a stable commodity behind it? Is that a concerning trend for growth looking forward that that if, you know, some other event does occur, maybe it's a pandemic, maybe it's something else, um, that a government is able to print more money in circulation and, and that, that total capacity of money has, has grown pretty dramatically over the last five, 10 years. Um, is that a concern and a headwind for uh, inhibiting kind of progress? No, the, uh, take the difference between the United States and Argentina. Argentina has more than 100% inflation. Venezuela has had as much as 800% inflation. So you're absolutely right that uncontrolled growth in the money supply can lead to unprecedented huge rates of inflation. But in most civilized countries in the world, and I uh, hate to say Argentina is not civilized, but its, it's fiscal and monetary policy certainly have been. Um, in most countries in the world, the central bank, which has the power to create explosive growth in money, has steadfastly vowed not to do that by having a 2% inflation target. Um, and when inflation goes above 2%, as we've seen in the United States in the last two and a half years, uh, the uh, central bank raises interest rates to get that money supply growth down and to get the inflation down. Uh, so it it is within the power of the central bank, but the central banks don't want to have that power and resist it in most well-run countries. The countries that um, have experienced rapid inflation have tended to be taken those that have been taken over by left-wing governments that put on massive subsidies to keep prices of consumer staples down. Those subsidies cost huge amounts of government money. That creates a government deficit. The deficit is financed by money creation. And lo and behold, they get inflation. That's the story in Argentina. That's the story in Venezuela and other countries like Zimbabwe uh, that have had huge inflations. Um, but uh, the developed countries in the world, the Euro, Canada, Japan, U.S., uh, they're all vowing to keep inflation stable. And they're taking action when it was not stable, even though it was not their fault. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fair. Um, all right, to wrap this up, this whole conversation, I just want to um, I want to think about the next century. You you use this term, the special century, in your book, talking about that period, eighteen seventy ish to nineteen seventy ish. Some of the some of the critical innovations, the zero to one moments in America. I'd love to hear your thoughts on if you can set the stage for why you know take take the position that we're on the cusp of another special century. I know in the in the end of the book you 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 highlight all these headwinds that you know maybe people believe that then we're not on the cusp of a special century but let's take the position that we are what are the key innovations what are the things that need to happen in order to make this next 100 years as special as that 1870 to 1970 phase i'm going to reject your premise uh, okay. i think the i think the main things that are going to happen in the next uh, i don't go out 100 years. I don't even go out 50 years. In my book, I forecast the growth of productivity uh, between 19, between 2015 and 2040. So let's just look at the next uh, 25 or so years. I think we're going to have two competing forces in the world that are going in different directions. One is artificial intelligence, which is going to steadily make it easier uh, to to do creative work of all types, whether it's video images, uh, artwork, essays, contracts. Uh, you've seen the uh, 
the in, enormous uh, success and popularity of chat GPT. So everyone's going to have their own specialized AI at their fingertips. Uh, it's going to be a nightmare for uh, instructors of writing composition because the students are all going to have access to a machine that can write their essays for them. And I'm facing that right now in a freshman <laughs> seminar that I teach. Uh, but uh, the other thing is climate change. I think the overriding thing that's going to happen over the next 40 to 50 years is going to be a lot of investment to make the transition away from fossil fuels. That's not going to make us better off. We're going to be trading one form of electric generation for another. We're going to be throwing out gas furnaces and installing heat pumps. They're not going to make our houses warmer. Uh, the struggle to get rid of those final emissions of carbon into the atmosphere is going to involve how do we make steel without emissions? How do we fly uh, airplanes without emissions, uh, those are going to be very difficult uh, uh, hurdles that we may just give up. We may wind up flying airplanes slower. I see just an enormous number of obstacles. Uh, you probably read about the huge increase in the electric grid that we're going to need to power all the, both the artificial intelligence computer networks and the um, uh, electric generation for the electric vehicles. Um, and the electric furnaces, and the electric everything. Uh, talk about electricity being the most important invention. Uh, mm -hmm. It's even more so now than it ever was. Uh, but um, so much of that investment is just going to be running in place to stand still in terms of our actual standard of living, uh, to avoid something rather than to create something, to avoid climate uh, becoming too hot and the seas rising and, and all that. I think actually the influence of climate change, as I listen to myself talk about this, is just more important than artificial intelligence because I don't think artificial intelligence applies to many of the things that ordinary people do in their everyday lives. Uh, being able to write an essay with chat GPT or design a book cover um, or edit a video is not going to change the fact that ordinary human beings are still arranging the goods on the shelves of supermarkets. And ordinary human beings are still driving snow plows through the streets of Evanston, Illinois, on the particular morning that we recorded this. Uh, so uh, uh, I think artificial intelligence applies to um, a limited part of the economy, a limited number of the people, mainly the people who work at home uh, or have jobs like that. Uh, and yet the fight against carbon emissions is worldwide and topic-wide. Everybody is going to have to make sacrifices to make that happen. So let's wrap it up there. I think that's a nice, gloomy, after all, if I'm known as the prophet of pessimism, I've got to be consistent and be <laughs> pessimistic about the future. Well, I appreciate you being honest. And actually, you just, you just introduced one other final follow-up question I want to ask is, I think, an important one. Is growth necessary? Because we've been looking at 2% per year growth for a long time. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's one, but it's typically been positive in America. Is it bad if it's negative? What happens? What are the, what are the ramifications of 0% or minus 1%? Is there a positive outcome that could come from less growth? The problem is that some people do better than others. Some people's income goes up more than average. Some people's income goes up less than average. If the average doesn't grow, that means the people going up less than average are actually falling behind or going backwards. That's the reason why we need growth. It's to, mm. keep, it's, it's to keep the people below average going in the right direction. That's, I think, the simplest way to explain it. I see. So we need to have more growth. And uh, let's hope chat GPT brings us some. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Well, Robert, thank you so much for taking the time today. I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book and discussing it with you today. Um, as a final note for listeners, where can folks go to learn more about you and your work? Uh, they can Google Robert J. Gordon, which is my website. It's got all sorts of uh, interesting things. If you, uh, if you Google my name, Robert J. Gordon, and go to my Northwestern website, 
Uh, you can read things that I've written. Uh, you can also see um, a photo gallery of uh, famous economists now in, in the past. Uh, so it's a fairly unique website. But more than that, I think you should simply go to Amazon and buy a book called uh, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, the <clears throat> U.S. Standard of Living Since the Civil War. Uh, that's the full title of the book, just The Rise and Fall of American Growth will get you uh, to Amazon and um, buy your copy. It's a great read. Love it. Thank you again for taking the time and thank you for writing this book.